one of the things that that so appeals to me about your poetry is the fact that it makes me feel more kind about myself not just like humor but about myself and let me um, cheer up thank you welcome and thank you to boswell bookshop here in milwaukee wisconsin for hosting this interview with us, Porchlight Book Company, and um, I'm Sally Halderson, Managing Director at Porchlight. We have the honor today of welcoming the renowned poet Ada Lamone. Ada is the author of six books of poetry, including The Carrying, which won the National Book Critics Award Circle Award for Poetry. She is also the host of the critically acclaimed poetry podcast, The Slowdown. In her new collection of poetry, The Hurting Kind, she writes about the human experience of suffering, hurt, and hope. First, I am excited to talk with you, Ada. Welcome, because I get to thank you directly for your poetry and how much it has fed me when I have needed to find a source of strength or a refueling of my resilience. I'm thinking specifically um, for the audience who is here that may not have um, Ada's books in front of you, um, make sure you write these down and Google them, Um, but How to Triumph Like a Girl and Instructions on Not Giving Up, Mm. Um, my experience reading this new collection has been similar to my attachment to those poems. I feel the hurt in each poem as a hurt that speaks to my hurt, but also the hope in each poem as a hope that speaks to my hope. Mm. And I am thrilled to meet you, thrilled to have you here. And I'm sure our attendees are super excited to hear from you. Welcome. Oh, thank you so much for that beautiful introduction. And especially I love to know that poetry has connected with someone or has moved someone or has been with them through their life because, you know, what we do is such a private thing on so many levels and such a, you know, I work in this office that I'm Zooming from in Kentucky and oftentimes the person, you know, the first, the first being hearing a poem is, um, is my dog and it always feels like a very sort of small act. And so, um, I mean, I can still remember the day I wrote How to Triumph Like a Girl. Um, and so it's it's just, to me, it's, it, it's so wonderful to hear those sort of personal and private acts um, and how they have connected with someone and continue to connect with people. It's, it's, it feels sort of miraculous in, in a way. Um, yeah, uh, anyway, I'll, I will read a poem. <laughs> Uh, I'll just also want to apologize that I am recovering from a cold. So for anyone who is, I'm hoping that my voice stays with us. Yes. Um, And this will be probably the most I've talked today um, or in two days because I was really trying to rest it so I can get back to recording the slowdown tomorrow, um, fingers crossed, because I had to bump it um, to recover from what I think is strep throat or was strep throat. Well, I'm excited to hear what you're going to read, and um, I have an unlimited number of things to talk to you about, so um, please take it away. Oh, yay. Okay, wonderful. Um, This is a poem from my stepfather, and um, I think just because I've been uh, um, feeling a little under the weather, I want to read this poem. A Good Story. Some days, dishes piled in the sink, books littering the coffee table are harder than others. Today, my head is packed with cockroaches, dizziness, and everywhere it hurts. Venom in the jaw, behind the eyes, between the blades. Still, the dog is snoring on my right, the cat on my left. Outside, all those red buds are just getting good. I tell a friend, The body is so body, and she nods. I used to like the darkest stories, the bleak snippets someone would toss out about just how bad it could get. My stepfather told me a story about when he lived on the streets as a kid, how he'd some nights sleep under the grill at a fast food restaurant until both he and his buddy got fired. I used to like that story for some reason something in me that believed in overcoming. But right now, all I want is a story about human kindness. The way once when I couldn't stop crying because I was 15 and heartbroken, he came in and made me eat 
a small pizza he'd cut up into tiny bites until the tears stopped. Maybe I was just hungry, I said, and he nodded, holding out the last piece. I love that poem. I'm so glad that you picked that one. I came back to that over and over again as I was sort of pulling on threads throughout the book. And I think that um, we can hold on to um, the word suffering in mm -hmm. this poem. Um, mm -hmm. In fact, I have it here. I want to make sure that I'm referring. Um, we can hold on to um, something in me that believed in overcoming. And there are a number of ways throughout this book that, that we revisit suffering, we revisit overcoming, we revisit simplicity over complexity. We revisit like the um, complications that the mind brings to our body and our experience of living in this world versus, I think, and this will open up to a larger conversation, um, animals in the natural world and how they function in a way that maybe isn't as full of cockroaches and as full of those thoughts that we convince ourselves are really, really important yeah. and but are also really, really distracting. Yeah. Um, that is one of my favorites. So we'll come back to that. Um, yeah. The what would for the, you know, poetry is a genre that counts and depends as much on the reader participating in the poem, mm -hmm. which is true in all genres. This mm -hmm. is not to discount any other way that we experience art. But with poetry, we really have, we bring that interpretation ourselves yeah. to the poem. Um, what do you hope? that people hearing that poem experience as you read it? And how do you really hope that your audience receives your poetry generally? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, it's interesting because I used to really have this sense that I wanted people to really get exactly what was my experience. And that was important to me as a young poet um, for many years. I thought that was what I, I needed to practice the art of you know, telepathy and be like, this is what I'm sending to you. Please see it exactly how I, how I have written it or how I experienced it. And then of course, as I've matured as a writer and as a human being, I'm, I'm sort of, I'm just, I'm now really curious as to what comes when other people read it. Right. And sometimes I had a woman come up to me the other day and I was like, she's like, well, I stopped listening because I was having this experience where I, I read, I, I was going through my own experience. And mm -hmm. you, you reminded me of that. And she, she was like, so I'm so sorry. I didn't listen to the poem, but I just, <laughs> I had this wonderful, you know, memory of my grandmother and this thing. And I remember thinking that's beautiful. Like if my entry or whatever it was, the thing mm -hmm. that pulled you towards a memory or an experience that was somehow reminded you what like the human experience is or mm -hmm. a moment of gratitude or whatever it was, felt so important to me that I, I think I've sort of, I'm, I'm relinquishing more and more as to what I want it to do for someone else. And I'm more and more interested as what it does for me as a writer and as an artist and then as a human. And it matters to me that like in this particular poem, it really matters to me that my stepfather likes this poem. Mm -hmm. And it becomes a more intimate relationship with the work and the poem itself and the poem making. And it's less about sort of like how it will be received beyond his own perception of it. Um, and so that he, that he sees it as an act of gratitude and offering and that, um, so that's that's that has shifted within me. Um, I do think this poem in particular is about kindness and it's about. Um, I think there's a lot of stories in our lives about, you know, the, the kind of the tough lesson, you know, that when we learn the hard lesson and we got over the thing or someone taught us the thing by being hard or tough. 
And especially when we deal with masculinity, and I feel like there's so much that is lost when we talk about masculinity um, in terms of how we don't praise tenderness very often. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to take a moment to do that. And I think this poem sort of started out as like, he was praised in my mind for his toughness you know, for what he overcome, for, you know, what he went through, for that sort of idea that he was like, you know, this sort of invincible, strong person. And then I was like, what if I take a moment and instead just praise the simple kindnesses and the tenderness and that moment of connection that he has with his little stepdaughter, who's just like crying up a storm and and I thought that was really important to me was that I think so often we praise men and women, but I think in particularly men um, just for their like strength. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to praise for tenderness. That reminds me of Cyrus and the snakes. Yeah. And I think that poem does somewhat the same thing. Yeah. Um, where it's really an ode to um, that, the, tenderness behind the masculinity um or a or an act that is supposed to be masculine like behaving yeah. the way that that a boy is supposed to act mm -hmm. when in actuality if it hadn't been witnessed perhaps there was something more gentle and softer happening there mm -hmm. would you want to read that poem i would love to and i love how they kind of dovetail into it um it's funny i um this book has so much of my family in it mm -hmm that even when you said Cyrus and the snakes, I got excited to hear his name. I'm like, that's my brother. I know. <laughs> Isn't that funny? Like I have, because I think this was the first book. Um, I mean, I've talked about my family in other poems, but I, mm -hmm. in other books, but I think this is the first book that um, I've like really used people's names. Right. Um, instead of being like, oh, my brother, oh my, like, you know, and I kind of love that, um, that he's here in in that in that way in his full in his full name I read this poem in front of him in um San Francisco and I said oh my brother is here and he it was very uh, it was very sweet moment where he everyone was you know were masked mm -hmm. and um everyone looked around and he was like like yeah it's like do I want this spotlight <laughs> yeah he was like, oh no people are looking at me. he's like I'm gonna have to have a public moment yeah exactly <laughs> he's not a public person um, okay. Cyrus and the snakes. My brother holds a snake by its head. The whole length of the snake is the length of my brother's body. The snake's head is held safely, securely, as if my brother is showing it something in the distant high grass. I don't know why he wants to hold them. Their strong bodies wrapping themselves around the warmth of his arm constricting and made of circles and momentum, slippery coolness smooth against the ground. Still, this image of him holding a snake as it snakes as snakes do, both a noun and a verb and a story that doesn't end well. Once we stole an egg from the backyard chicken coop and cracked it just to see what was inside, a whole unhatched chick, where we expected yolk and mucus was an unfeathered and unfurled sweetness. We stared at the thing, dead now and unshelled by curiosity and terrible youth. My brother pretended not to care so much while I cried, though only a little. Still, we buried it in the brush by the creeping thistle that tore up our arms with their speared leaves barbed at the ends like weapons stuck in the rattlesnake grass. But I knew. I knew that he'd cry if he was alone, if he wasn't a boy in the summer heat, being a boy in the summer heat. Years later, back from Mexico or South America, he'd admit he was tired of history, of always discovering the ruin by ruining it, wrecking a forest for a temple, a temple that should be simply left a temple. He wanted it to all stay as it was, even if it went undiscovered. I want to honor a man who wants to hold 
a wild thing, only for a second, long enough to admire it fully, and then wants to watch it safely return to its life, bend to be sure the grass closes up behind it. So it will not be the first time I get chills on my arms. It's a beautiful tribute. Um, when you wrote that poem, were you consciously writing to him? Were you mm -hmm. consciously writing um, to your small self? Like, what is the generative moment for something like that, a memory? Yeah, this poem started with the snakes. <laughs> um, he had actually sent me a, a picture a while back of him holding the snake and it's, and it, you know, it's, he's holding it safely by its head and it's literally like this. And it's just something he's found in the grass. Um, and it, that image was with me. And, and I had realized that I had been writing so many animal poems and I was partly interested and curious as to what it would be to lean into the obsession, right? I think a lot of people are like, oh, I'm, I'm writing animal poems, I should pull back. And I was like, I'm going, doubling down. And, um, and so for me, it began with, okay, I, I have this snake and I, I, I'm very interested in, in what it is that interests him in them. Um, I don't have, I, I really like snakes in terms of, you know, looking at them from a distance, yeah. but I'm not someone that wants to hold them. Um, and so, and then I was really surprised at where the poem went. It um, completely was not, I had no idea. So I literally started with him and the snake and just, and just sort of kept pulling and see where it went. And then, and that's really took that a whole different, a different turn. I didn't, I didn't expect it. I think that, as you said earlier, um, then moments like that, what you captured there and, and reflected back, then, you know, I have an older brother. And so this brings to mind, you know, the photo of us feeding the lambs or the photo, you know, like it, it can bring those kinds of, um, moments of tribute in ourselves mm -hmm. because we don't always pay the kind of attention to how formative, um, those sort of casual occurrences in childhood actually were. And I think that that is definitely a thread that we can follow through this book. We have, um, uh, I should ask you ahead of time. Yeah. And I do know that um, I did watch a reading that you did where I think you addressed this, but um, do we refer to the narrator of these poems as the narrator or the speaker, or do I refer to them as you? Or how do you prefer to talk about Thank your Thank you for asking that. I think it's really, I think the speaker is always really helpful when you're in workshop because it's not okay. like, you know, you, you can talk about hard subjects or you can critique a poem and you're not critiquing the person. Um, but these all these are all poems. I am, I am the speaker. Right. You can, you, yeah. I had, um, is the I in your poems meant to be read as you or as the universal I, or is that up to the reader, which I think is probably what happens and what you were talking about is yeah. that this is you, but it is also us and what we yes. bring to the poem. Yes. Um, one additional sort of general poetry question to you, because I think it is one that's really um, applicable to our time now, whether we're talking about um, the attention poetry got with Amanda Gorman's mm. work and um, oh, yeah. just sort of a, a general heightening of attention to poetry during the pandemic. And, and we're, we might segue into the pandemic here, but I am curious about, um, there's a lot of debate about the accessibility of poetry and how accessibility equates or does not equate to quality. Um, plenty of people like to talk about that, but at the same time say that poetry is a necessity. It's essential to the human heart's hierarchy of needs mm -hmm. um, or as a common voice of the people, as a salvation during times of trouble, like they're a rallying cry. Um, and of course, two, two or five things can be true all at the same time. Right. Um, where do you come down on accessibility and how you, um, does it inform your work and do you have any feel like you have any kind of obligation to an audience or are you really writing for yourself? 
that's a lot of questions in there. Feel free to go where you want. No, I love it. I think that's a great question. And I, it's really clear to me because I think that is a conversation that keeps continuing. And, and I know my work is in that part of that conversation and is held up as examples from both sides on whether mm -hmm. they think it's like, you know, a good thing or a bad thing. And I, um, I think for me, you know, I started writing poetry really for my family and to my friends and um, in particular, like my stepfather who's in this poem. And I, it, I was really kind of taught early on that it wasn't something that was sort of academic or an intellectual experiment, but rather something that was crafted to create a significant emotional response or connection, even just connection. Um, and so I've always sort of honored that even, you know, from a very early on. Um, I think there was a time in my life in particular, you know, going through graduate school and really focusing on the craft and really, really trying to hone my skill and, and trying to make sure that people knew that I was smart and people knew that I knew the prosody and the elements of crafts that could build or break a poem or to start to have, you know, poetic references within my own work. Um, but now I just, for me, I mean, I, I'll reference poets all the time and it doesn't mean if you've heard of them or songs or music and I don't feel like I'm doing that out of any kind of proving or sort of an intellectual experiment, experiment, but to really like that's, that is what's on my mind, right? That it's like the poem is an actual honest portrayal of my weird and chaotic human brain on the page and what's happening with it. Um, and so I think that I've let go of some of that audience expectation or readership ideas. Um, and I think I've kind of had to because I think for a for a, for a quick second when um, Bright Dead Things came out in 2015 and then did really well, I suddenly was like, I was read by like no one. And then I was read by a lot of people. And um, I had to figure out a way to kind of shut that expectation out and make sure that the readership all, you know, audience was not in the room while I was composing. Mm -hmm. So this book actually, um, and all, all the books since then, um, have all felt very private to me, but it's 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 a work to keep it private and to make it private and intimate. And I think that in some ways, the more private I get sometimes, there is this element where people find it um, re is reflecting their own world. And I'm impressed by that and amazed by that, but it's not what I start out doing. I don't write the poem and think someone will find something in this. Oftentimes I'm thinking this is the poem I needed to write to save myself today, um, you know, or to, or to send to a friend or just because I missed my father, I want to send this poem to my father, mm -hmm. you know, whatever it is. And so I think that that's um, the impulse and the intention for me needs to be as much as possible in the true making of the poem and in the true reason for the poem as opposed to any kind of expectation beyond its life within my heart and my family. You mentioned um, the poem you needed to survive that day. And I think we have um, a lot of moments in this book about finding way, ways, small ways to survive, mm -hmm. which are emblematic of finding the larger um, yeah meaning. And of course, um, I am assuming that the majority of these poems were written during the pandemic. And I don't know if that would be true. Yeah, I would say maybe half of them. Okay. Yeah. And so I might, I run the risk of maybe identifying a few that are not uh, oh, pandemic fine. survival poems, that's but funny. maybe yeah. life sur survival poems. <laughs> um, but they're there's a very specific sense of time in this collection. It obviously the the sort of the the constraint of the collection itself is one year of seasons, 
Mm -hmm. or just a cycle of seasons, depending on how you would want to look at that. But mm -hmm. there's also a timelessness where I think um, the book can and will be read during non-pandemic times, which, oh, yeah, exactly. Um, and I'm wondering if, if you were sort of deliberately trying to side-eye the pandemic a little bit and not be too specific, mm -hmm. but also um, capture it maybe another way of saying that is to capture it, but not center it. Mm -hmm. And I think that we are all just beginning to recognize um, sort of the reckoning that's going to, to happen with the fallout of the pandemic on every level. And that poetry um, can be a way of hastening healing, sharing a con that common experience. Um, and I read Vanished Wonders mm -hmm. and Lovers, Mm. Lover as two of the poems that speak to the pandemic, totally. but not of the pandemic. Totally. Um, so uh, of either of those poems, is there one you would prefer to read? I would love to um, have you read one of them. Um, either one. I mean, let's do, can we do Lover? Yeah. Let's do that one. Because um, there's some. It's a. I'm so glad you asked about that because I do think when we talk about, I love how you said centering the pandemic um, or not. And I think that there's, for me, this way in which it's very hard for me to take anything on like really straight on mm -hmm. because it, it, will, it will often feel untrue to me um, or like I'm forcing it, or it's just for prose, right? Like mm -hmm. this many people have died. This is what I'm, you know, like that's, it's huge and it's big and it's important. Um, but I find with my poetry, I need to enter it from a different place. I can't mm -hmm. enter it head on. Right. I can't do that. Or it just falls apart. Like, even if I say, I'm going to sit down and write a poem about this, you know, mm -hmm. it's why occasional poetry is very hard for me. Um, it's very hard in general, right. um, which is why I think Amanda Gorman did actually such a beautiful <laughs> job with that poem. Hard to, it's hard to imagine. It's moment. so intense to have someone say, here's your assignment. Mm -hmm. I mean, can you imagine? And so I think, you know, occasional poetry is like, it's not given a lot of credit because I was like, oh, well, and I was like, because it is an assignment. It's literally, this is what mm -hmm. it is supposed to do. It is a public poem and a public poem is entirely different from a private poem. And um, they have different voices. They have different, like, they are meant to do literally something else. Um, and so I think like taking something head on is, is very difficult. Um, and for those people that can do it, and if you, you know, are tasked to do it, it's, I mean, I urge everyone to try it. It's incredibly right. hard. Um, but yeah, so this poem in particular is, uh, is I think the closest, well, there's a few others, but this, mm -hmm. this was particularly um, had to do with the pandemic. Lover. Easy light storms in through the window, soft edges of the world smudged by mist, a squirrel's nest rigged high in the maple. I've got a bone to pick with whomever is in charge. All year I've said, you know what's funny? And then nothing, nothing is funny, which makes me laugh in an oblivion is coming sort of way. A friend writes the word lover in a note and I'm strangely excited for the word lover to come back. Come back lover, come back to the five and dime. I could squeal with the idea of blissful release. Oh lover, what a word, what a world this gray waiting in me a need to nestle deep into the safe keeping of sky. I'm too used to nostalgia now, a sweet escape of age, centuries of pleasure before us and after us, still right now a softness like the worn fabric of a nightshirt. And what I do not say is, I trust the world to come back, return like a word long forgotten and maligned for all its gross tenderness, a joke told in a sunbeam, the world walking in, ready to be ravaged, open for business. I think we all, I don't think anyone could listen or read that poem without feeling that connection to um, that hope that the world is coming back and the things mm -hmm. that have been, um, can no longer be had. This is true yeah. again for the other poem that I mentioned as well, Vanished Wonders, that. Mm -hmm. 
um, we have in some ways made had to make choices about what we value and how we spend our time in a way that we didn't have to do before those constraints on our lives pushed us in a certain direction, but also pushed us away from things. Mm -hmm. And now we have the further away from things that we get, the more reflection we have on those and whether they are valuable. And I remember at um, probably during the first year, I thought, you know, are we just going to bounce back? Is this just a rubber band where we're going to bounce back to where we were before? Like we've just been stretched to the end of our, our resources, but everyone's coveting what once was. And are we, is that going to be the standard or have we actually stretched the rubber band to the point where we have moved somewhere yeah. new and different? And I don't know the answer to that, but right. um, I does, think yeah. that the, one of the ways to read this collection is about the nostalgia that you mentioned in this poem, but also memory in general. And then how responsible are we to bringing the past forward with us and mm -hmm. how much value is actually in nostalgia? How mm -hmm. much is it about um, creating new, less, um, burned with meaning things. I don't know if that's a thing. Yeah. Um, but how did how do you feel that you've navigated? Um, and maybe this connects to the the like cycle of nature through the seasons in the book. That it is it was progressive, mm -hmm. but at the same time spirals and comes back again. Right. Um, I think that there is something that that we can take from this collection when it, um, with a sense of renewal. Right. I don't know if that was delivered or not. Yeah, I think there is. I mean, I do, I do have hope. <laughs> I do. I, you know, I, I don't know. I, I, I'll, I'll, I always laugh that I'm like, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, I think I'm a very earnest person, mm -hmm. but I'm also very, suspicious and I tend to I can definitely live in the well in the bottom of the well but I think for the most part like I really believe in hope and I think that it's very dangerous to give up hope mm -hmm. um and so I think this book has to have it because I had to have it <laughs> and mm -hmm. you know I love when people find the light in the book because I know the book is is heavy too um, and it, I, it has a mix, right? I think it has a mix of the weightedness and then also the, um, you know, the light. But I feel like the, there's so much there that um, I need to find those those slivers of hope. And, and I think especially at this time when things feel so burdened and it feels like, oh, we had a moment of like, oh, the pandemic is sort of over and then right. we're vaccinated. And then there's a moment where there's a dip and now it's all coming, it seems to be coming back and so many people we know have it, mm -hmm. but luckily, hopefully not to the extent that we did pre-vaccination. And, um, and then at the same time, you know, we have the school shooting, we have the shooting in Buffalo, we have all of these things. And I think that it's so hard not to lose hope in humanity. And I felt like maybe in some ways decentering humanity was useful. Decentering de myself, decentering de um, our own sort of role in everything, which was like, what is the world without us? You know, and even like the you know watching the squirrels, you know, and like this sort of idea of like, oh, what is it without me? Like they're having their moment. I would like to, I would like to have a nest up there in that safekeeping of the sky, you know, like just sort of getting out of myself and my head and, and this sort of deeply troubled human body that we live in. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's a textured answer because it's a textured question, which is, you know, I, I know that I have it and I hold on to it, but I know that it's work and I think hope is work. Um, 
Yes, I. that's a wonderful, just to highlight that because I think <laughs> some people think hope is easy and cynicism is work. Right. And it's, I don't think that that's true. I think hope is, um, is very active, right? And um, there are, there are two poems that remind me, um, bring me back in this conversation. And I'm not sure, I don't think I could pick a favorite, but um, one of them is, let me see if I can get the title correct. It's the seasons, I forget. Is that the, it's the seasons? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and the mountain lion. Yeah. And in both of those poems, I get that sense of um, hope mm. that, so the, the one with the seasons is obviously um, applies to this particular point in the conversation, which is about the construction of the book and using seasons and using the natural world to see that sort of cyclical process yeah. and um, sort of the reversal in this poem, if you would yeah. be willing to read this one. Yeah, um, I love that you brought that up, but this is in the fall section of the book. Mm -hmm. And um, even though we are in the spring section of our lives, <laughs> um, at least here in, um, in North America, mm -hmm. um, but I do feel like there's, um, there's something, I'm not, I'm actually not a fall person. <laughs> it's very strange. It's because, but it's only because I'm not a winter, winter person. Oh, so I get so sign. scared of winter coming. Mm -hmm. That fall is just, it reminds me that winter is coming, but I, I, I every fall I'm like, you know what? I'm going to love it. I'm going to love it. So I'm, I'm really working on my attachment to fall. Um, It's the season I often mistake, mm. birds for leaves and leaves for birds. The tawny yellow mulberry leaves are always goldfinches tumbling across the lawn like extreme elation. The last of the maroon crab apple ovates are song sparrows that tremble all at once. And today, just when I could not stand myself any longer, a group of field sparrows, which were actually field sparrows, flew up into the bare branches of the hackberry, and I almost collapsed. Leaves reattaching themselves to the tree, like a strong spell for reversal. What else did I expect? What good is accuracy amidst the perpetual scattering that unspools the world? It's a remarkable image, and I think that it um, reflects throughout, scattered throughout the collection, this sort of um, use of, even though this is very literal, the as opposed to um, interpretive with the leaves being birds, and these are actually birds flying back up into the tree, but I think there's something so magical about it, yeah. and there is a lot of magic to be found. Mm -hmm. um, you use the word conjuring at one point in one of the poems. And I think mm -hmm. um, you, I'm not going to get, I'm not going to remember it correctly, but you refer to a, a, like a ghost of a cat walking back into the room. Yeah. It's just this way that um, we are revisited and that if we continue to believe in the magic of things and the interpretive um, choose to interpret things within a lens of magic as opposed to things falling apart. I think that's what we were sort of talking about, that hope is active yeah. and hope is work. And that's, it's. Yeah, I think that's very true. And I also think that I love that idea of sort of giving up like, I, you know, as poets were always, they're very insistent on, um, getting the, the correct image and getting the accuracy of the name of the tree and the name of the bird and the name of the, you know, whatever it is, the, the all of the senses correct. But I think it's also sometimes that we do have to release to not the facts, but mm -hmm. the magic, the, the fact that for a moment there was every part of my bones and body that thought those birds flew back on that tree and the leaves literally flew back onto the tree. And I thought, I'm witnessing that. Mm -hmm. And then of course, no, I, I, that doesn't make any sense. Of course they were birds. And of course that's what I saw. Now I can see them in the tree. But that moment feels like 
such a gift Mm -hmm. because it's it throws yourself it 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 opens the door for possibilities of other things happening like oh if that could happen what else could happen what else could happen and I think that's really important and it goes back to hope is work is that that idea of like oh if hope is work like so is that believing in magic and believing in this grim between worlds and um and going back again to say to thinking that it's like we're not always the center of this mm-hmm. like there's something else that's happening those birds and that image that wasn't just for me that was just this amazing thing that happened in the in this little small moment of my day and who am i to think what was happening to me before that or on email or on zoom <laughs> or, you know was more important and i think there's also a getting away of that There's that reminds me of um, Drowning Creek, which is one of my Mm -hmm. favorite poems. And um, you highlight the distance between animals and humans. And you do this often in a number of these poems is is how humans reflect themselves onto animals and whether that is maybe not right, maybe not morally right, but whether it's a it's necessary to do that to love an animal or to appreciate yeah. an animal? Do we need to make them into more human? Right. Do we need to anthropomorphize? The other way is then that that the animals in many of your poems actually reflect back something that maybe we should long for more of mm. and maybe some sort of, I mean, I think that's true for the mountain lion. And I think that's true in mm. Drowning Creek where we mm. have um, in Drowning Creek, you posit that the this bird that um, you saw in a glimpse while driving in a car um, is not occupied by assigning meaning to things like humans are. Um, People were nothing to that bird. I was nothing to that bird. That bird wasn't concerned with history or names. And you find the solitude of the bird's mind enviable. And that happens a lot also throughout this collection where you're reflecting on the complications that our brains, our human brains bring Mm -hmm. to existence that perhaps the animal, like you were saying about the squirrel's nest and and that sort of, I suppose, solitude then too, uh, being up there and wishing you had that. Um, Can you speak a little bit about what what it is about, um, is this too simplistic of a question, the animal, experience that you think informs what you long for? Yeah, I mean, I think that there is, it's very funny as we're talking, these squirrels are building this crazy nest in the tree and it's like the outside in the silver maple and it's just, they're just going bonkers. Um, and I'm so excited. I mean, they're like walking around with like whole like branches in their mouth, basically like leaves. Um, <laughs> Clearly, they want to be part of this conversation. Uh, I think that for me, I've always just been so interested in the fact that we don't, I mean, I remember being like 12 and sitting with my friend, um, Aaron uh, slash Echo, Echo, um, who uh, is actually a park ranger in in Yosemite and is like, has always been very connected to the natural world. And we were, I think we were quite young and we were sitting there and she was talking about like, how weird it is that like we even consider another human being ugly because she's like we like in the natural world like no one would be like you maybe it would be wounded or something but it wouldn't you know uh but there was there wouldn't be any part of us that would consider like oh that's an ugly lion or you know I don't know Mm -hmm. and so I remember having this discussion this very sort of heady conversations two 12 year olds like talking about what it was to remember that we are animals Mm -hmm. and it felt really important and it felt like right like we are we are an animal we are a human animal and with it comes a lot of baggage and it becomes you know with our with our highly evolved minds becomes our you know highly chaotic and 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 injured and, and, and hurting minds and our hurting hearts and our worry and our anxiety and our depression and our fears and our need for safety and yet for some reason our insistence upon violence and all of those things and I think um 
I think there is, it's not so much that there's a sort of simplicity in watching the animals, but I think there is a release in which I am remembering that it's okay sometimes to just be, mm. to watch them, like I'm watching them build this nest. It's like, they're not worried about what's happening right now. You know, they're going to make it safe and what they're, you know, and then they'll protect it against the crows and all of those things will happen. Um, but this sort of sense of ongoingness and the sense of the world that is going on without the constant chatter of the mind, I think is really important to me to always recognize it. And I think I feel most myself when I'm paying attention to that. And I feel sort of less ego and everything else, you know? And it so brings me back to myself. It, rem it reminds me that I have core and that inside that core, there is a stillness and there is a peace and there is a connectedness and there is an instinct and there is, you know, all of those things. Mm -hmm. And it's not always um, healthy for me to live my entire world in my mind, which I think as artists, especially as poets, we often do. I mean, we are, we give our this like credit to like the language and the crafting and the, you know, and I think sometimes it's really good for me to be like, you know, it's not all up here, like to remember that, that there is more, that there's another level. And so, yeah, I feel like it's not simple, but I love that phrase too, but it, there's a, maybe a clarity of purpose. Yeah. That, um, Something that I really admire. Yeah. I, um, I think there are some, uh, in we're just gonna we're gonna um tantalize people with the mountain lion they can oh yeah I can really buy I can the book that if you want um let's actually okay. uh, let's just leave, let, let's leave that as an unsatisfied um uh desire for them for everybody now because I love it. it is it's terrific but I think it um because we have many more to talk about and um I think that it that poem speaks to me in the same way that how to triumph like a girl does mm -hmm. and how the, um, if we, if we could actually turn off all the messaging sometimes mm -hmm. that we have in our heads, that we would be far more courageous and we would be far more brave and we would be far mm -hmm. more instinctual. And, um, I think that the, um, and maybe treat ourselves more kindly. Mm. And I, I think that there is one of the things that, that so appeals to me about your poetry is the fact that it makes me feel more kind about myself, yeah. not just like okay. human, but about myself. Yeah, and that made um, me want to cheer up. Thank you. It's, and I feel that way, how to triumph like a girl, the mountain lion and it, and one of my favorite poems, which is let me see if I is the magnificent free game. Oh, yeah. Which you wouldn't, it surprised me this poem. Mm -hmm. Like it just, it took me by surprise. I don't think I have it. I don't have one of those copied. Um, but can we, can we read that one? Yeah. Um, because I think everybody needs to um, be inspired to feel more kind to themselves and yeah. we can be that. I think there's so, that's so true. Like, I'm always impressed at the way we can be with each other and how we show up for friends and family and, and people and, and then how we can go to bed and be like, God, I look terrible in my nightgown. Like what? Right. <laughs> like what? Like, that's crazy to me. Mm -hmm. And I feel like, you know, that, that's something I really pay attention to and work on. And it, it doesn't always work. Sometimes I'm still up there criticizing myself or leaving a reading or a zoom and being like, Oh, what did I do? Or whatever, you know, and that's part of living. But I think also like not biting myself, like, okay, yes, I did that. And now let's move on and let's be kind again. Mm -hmm. um, and that stuff, you know, surprisingly, truly works like remembering what it is to to cherish this mm -hmm. you know um 
and really cherish it. I don't know. Yeah. I, I'm still, I mean, it's a lifelong process. It we'll is see. a lifelong process. You know, I'll keep, keep going. I've crossed my fingers twice during the Zoom. I do not know why, but um, <laughs> it's like the, I, I'm like the cross the fingers emoji. Like that was like the yeah, little. Yeah, right. Yeah. As long as we're not doing like the yeah. mind blown. And yeah. <laughs> oh, um, so this is, this is funny because I was actually with us. I was teaching in Rio um, oh. and I looked out the window and it was just, it was just a one-on-one -on -one tutorial with this wonderful writer um it was um from colombia and she was down there with us and I, I i looked out the window and just i had never seen this bird before and i had then i learned the name in in this poem which came. is this which is the part of what makes the the poem so amazing is the the odd the oddity of it right yeah the actual name yeah okay yes. so this is called the magnificent frigate bird is it okay to begin with the obvious I'm full of stones. Is it okay not to look out this window, but to look out another? A mentor once said, you can't start a poem with a man looking out a window. Too many men looking out a window. What about a woman? Today is a haunting. One last orange on the counter, it is a dead fruit. We swallow dead things. Once in Rio near Leblon, large seabirds soared over the vast South Atlantic Ocean. I had never seen them before. Eight foot wingspan and gigantic in their confident gliding, black with a red neck like a wound or hidden treasure or both. When I looked it up, I learned it was the magnificent frigate bird. It sounded like that enormity of a bird had named itself. What a pleasure to say, I am magnificent. And two, they traveled as a team, so I wondered if they named each other, generously tapping on one another's deeply forked tail or their plumage, glistening with salt air, their guller sacks, saying, you are magnificent. You are also magnificent. It makes me wanna give all my loves the adjectives they deserve. You are resplendent. You are radiant. You are sublime. I'm far away from tropical waters. I have no skills for flight or wings to skim the waves effortlessly like the wind itself. But from here, I can still imagine rapture, a glorious caught fish in the mouth of a bird. I think we need to read that every day to ourselves and the people that we love. <laughs> but also, you know, I, I don't want to take away from, um, there's also something to me that in that last line and the idea of being the fish, which mm -hmm. is actually out of its habitat, um, mm -hmm. perhaps taking a, a wondrous flight, but also a flight to inevitable death. Yeah. <laughs> Unfortunate. Like I think that 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 it's a wonderfully positive and hopeful poem, but you never lose sight in any of these poems really about the fact that that the urgency of these poems is about mortality. Yeah. And it's about the fact that these are fleeting moments. Yeah. And um that's the hard part and the, the painful part of the words we put on the page, the, the pictures on a, in a photograph, um, or remembrances of people that we no longer have with us for, yeah. you know, all of the reasons. And yeah. so there is, I think, there's a shadow on each, but I, but that shadow, whether it's mortality or, or difficulty or suffering, mm -hmm. which we've talked about is what makes the hope so urgent and yeah. so necessary. And I think there are a lot of people these days who are saying, you know, the world is worse than it ever has been. Right. And it takes work. As you said, hope is work to think something other than that. Yeah. And I think that when we get into that sort of area of despair, 
I think we have to remember that despair is very dangerous because giving up is very dangerous mm -hmm. for our earth, for each other. You know, if we just give up, what will become of us? And so I think hope is work and it's also active. Um, and I think that's really important to remember because I, I, I feel very scared if we decide to despair and decide to give up. You know? I am a, I am astonished that it is 6.57. Oh my gosh. We, and so we are having to wrap up this conversation. Um, but if we can just like squeeze in a moment to, to talk about the title poem, yeah. The Hurting Kind, to talk about um, oral storytelling, to talk about legacy, to talk about um, whether it's possible to sum up a human life. Um, I'm making a big stretch there from, you know, the shadow mm -hmm. of, of mortality and the people that we remember. Um, but that is obviously um, a significant poem in the, in the book. It's also the longest poem in the book, I believe. Yeah, it um, is. So if we can pay, we can give a moment to the hurting kind. Yeah. I think for me, I mean, that with the idea of the title in that poem in particular is, um, I wanted to just really honor what it was to be tender, to be sensitive, to allow ourselves grief. Um, and I think so often, so many terrible things come out of not allowing ourselves grief or hurt and not allowing to say I'm hurt, mm -hmm. I'm having a hard time. And I, yes, I believe in bravery and courage and strength. You know, I believe in all of those things, but I also believe in, in tenderness and weakness and letting ourselves fail and crying. And, and I think um, I wanted to sort of honor that legacy of people who allow themselves to be tender to the world. That is definitely um, reading this collection and being gifted with um, how you see the world so that we can um, expand how we see the world is certainly um, such, a, such a needed experience after the past few years. And just generally, I think even as this is read post pandemic or, or with a sort of nostalgia, whether that is an appropriate word for this time, um, what anchors us is each other and what anchors us is, is our participation in nature as, um, as animals, yeah. as participatory animals in, in this life. And, um, I think you remind us of all of those things and more, and I'm so uh, pleased to have gotten to speak with you. And I am sure that everyone who watches our recording, um, will be as mind blown emoji can't help, but do it. Um, <laughs> um, from this conversation and uh, <laughs> yes. And I hope that I encourage everybody obviously to, um, by all of Ada's books, but particularly this new one, because it is what we need at a time when we need it. Thank you so much for all of your marvelous questions and for such a great heartfelt conversation. I felt, I felt like I was just chatting with a friend. I enjoyed every minute of it. <laughs> Thank you so much. And um, bye everyone. Thank you for joining us.